Good morning, everybody. Y'all got it's early, so you got to do a little better than that. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm beyond grateful to be here. Um, it's good to be amongst friends and colleagues and people that I've been in the trenches with. Uh, so it's 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 it feels comfortable. Feels like home. Um, Thank you to everybody who helped plan this conference and, and gave me an opportunity to be able to be here. I had um, prepared to speak um, and start my talk in a certain way, uh, but I um, did something on the weekend that you're not supposed to do. I opened my email <laughs> and um, opened it at, at 12 a.m. on Sunday and got a report from our traffic division of our police department that we had suffered our 12th bike pedestrian death this year. Um, the interesting thing and, and, and what makes it even worse was a hit and run. And it happened in a corridor uh, where we had another death in February of this year. And just two weeks ago, I had just gotten an allocation of hundreds of thousands of dollars to enhance pedestrian access in that very corridor. The community stood up when that first death happened I um, mean, called myself out and the county out and the state DOT out um, for doing something different. And that's why we had made our due diligence to take certain actions um, when we did. But when I saw that press release, obviously I could not sleep. My stomach was churning because there's a reality to our work. Um, there's a life and death situation. And when your job is to ensure the well being of others, whether you're a teacher or a pastor or social worker or a mentor or in planning or engineering, um, you literally feel like um, you have people's lives in your hands. Right? Um, as director of traffic and transportation in the city of Charleston, I too feel that sense of responsibility when somebody decides to get into their motor vehicle, when they decide to stand at a transit stop, when they put on their walking shoes, when they hop on a bike, I feel that they've made a mobility decision that they feel should get them safely to their destination. And so that responsibility weighs on me, uh, weighs on me heavily. It weighs on me so much that I actually got an executive coach. And um, no, I'm not crazy or deranged. Um, I just feel like it's important when you're passionate about something that you have a clarity of thought. And so after meeting with uh, my executive coach for, for a little bit, she, um, she asked me this question that kind of hit me in the chest. She said, how much time do you take to pause and reflect? And I said to her, you know, well, I, I do my prayer, my devotion time. And she stopped me mid-sentence and she said, no, no, when things get stressful um, and when it, there's challenges that sit in front of you, uh, where do you go to just pause? Where do you go to take reflection time? And um, she said, you should find a place where you can do that and be able to take that time. And so I don't know if I was too sure about that. I'm a type A person. And so for me, pressing pause equals laziness. And so I went to the smartest person I knew, my wife, and, um, and mentioned um, the suggestion to her. And um, she did not agree with me. She agreed with my executive coach. And so I decided to be obedient um, and make the right decision. Right. So. Um, so where's my place, you might be asking. My place, if you're sitting at my desk at 180 Lockwood in Charleston and you look over to your left, you'll see Brittle Bank Park and you'll see the Ashley River. And at the end of Brittle Bank Park is this pier and if you walk out to it, everything changes from urban to just marshland and all you hear is water and birds. And sometimes I go out there and um, usually when I'm out there is five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe take a phone call, do a walking meeting just so I can take time to pause. Um, this one time in particular, uh, I could not shake faces. I could not shake faces. I couldn't shake faces of residents, of workers, of visitors in the city that I serve that have unfortunately become victims of inequitable access. People who were victims not necessarily because there were solutions, but because people didn't have the audacity to answer them. I thought about this young man, he was in his chef's jacket, he was walking on this highway median. I was there because I was taking pictures, we're trying to get this $20 million bike ped bridge connecting West Ashley and the medical district. Um, but he was there because that's the way that he walked to work every day. He worked at the hotel that was right next door to my office and in order for him to get to work, he had to traverse a bridge that did not accommodate him. I remember this married couple, they were standing at this intersection at Rutledge and the Crosstown and all they wanted to do was cross the street. There was a 
pickup driver who was in the rightmost lane. He was looking left, but he was not looking right. And so as the free flow of traffic was going through, he found his space, pressed the gas, and the wife ended up pinned under one of the wheels, and her husband was banging on the window, begging for him to back off his wife. Thought about when I was rushing from the West Ashley Greenway, and I made a left turn onto US 17, and I looked to my right, and there was this elder black woman with her grocery bags at a transit stop um, waiting for the bus. The light turned green, and the rain began to pour, and she was still standing there without a shelter. Thought about the number of staff. I have 53 employees that work for me. I can count on one hand the amount of employees that actually live in the city of Charleston. In fact, I talked to my administrator. It was one of the first conversations I had with Judy, and she let me know that her one-way trip for the last 19 years has been 90 minutes. Thought about this 11-year-old Danish girl. She and her father were visiting Charleston for the very first time. They were walking on the sidewalk, and an inebriated driver came barreling down a one-way street, hopped the curb, hit her, hit the barrel, and dragged them both three-quarters of the way through a park. I remember touching the ground where the road, where the tires had gone. The father had ran over. He was a doctor, tried to revive his daughter. She died in his arms that night. And I thought about this young man. I was rushing into the office, just trying to get some work done, and he stopped me. He was on his bike, and he stopped me, and he said, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you for any money. Um, I just want to know how I don't go back to the streets. I didn't know what to say to him. He explained to me that he used to sell drugs, um, but he now was a janitor in a hospitality space, and uh, money was low. He um, was more or less than minimum wage, um, and pay was not going to come for the next two days. And he had two kids, and he was explaining to me as tears began to come down his eyes that his daughter had approached him and said, asked him, am I on punishment? And the reason why she asked is because she hadn't eaten in two days, and she thought that that was her punishment. I didn't know what to do, so I just, we had a Publix that was next door, and just walked him over there, was just like, get whatever you want, bro. I just didn't know what to do. Face after face after face came to mind, and most likely as I've been talking, faces have come to mind for you in your work or maybe your family or even your staff. May I suggest that we have enough experts in the room to know that there are answers? May I also suggest that there's a level of audacity needed by experts like ourselves to push past the status quo and demand something different? May I also suggest that we have an opportunity to change the narrative on how we define equitable access and how we build Communities. And just so we're on the same page, let me define equity for us. Equity is the intentional elimination of disparities disproportionately impacting marginalized people in a community. It's the joining together to take proactive steps in embracing the complexity of experiences, elevating the potency of inclusion, exposing the creativity in every single community, demanding honesty and calling out racism and oppression, both overt and systematic, and striving to co-empower, and I give a shout out to my girl Tamika for that word, citizens to implement goals. Equity is achieved when no one is blocked from reaching their full potential, no matter their race, their gender, their sex, their disability, their economic position, or other social economic determinant. And let me be clear, equity in and of itself is not simply the maturation towards inclusion. It's a tailored strategy that closes the gap between opportunity and access, ultimately eliminating privilege. We have a history of transportation being purposefully done in an unapologetic way to exasperate inequity, and that has to change. Y'all know these stuff. I mean, one-way streets has historical aspects to determine who can be in and who can be out. Measurements in our engineering and planning that are like level of service that are on an A to F scale, determining how fast a car can go from point A to point B, not even giving credence to mode shift or mode share. Ordinances that crack the door or profiling like in Detroit, where if you were 12 years old or younger, you had to have a letter from a parent or guardian saying you could ride your bike or police could confiscate it for up to six months. Construction street blocking permits for major developments that did not stipulate proper accommodations for pedestrians, new micro-mobility options that completely neglect the unbanked even though they are the same people with the highest percentages of death and injuries on the road, zoning code rewrites that open the door to infill development in places that were once seen as throwaways that all of a sudden are great opportunities, 
and even RFP selection criteria that welcomes in the engagement of marginalized communities at stakeholder meetings, but refrains from including them on the proposal for the RFP. As advocates, as business leaders and the like, we have to welcome the challenge of facing a history that has ignited such disparities and make equity a priority. So here's what I want to do. I think we can collectively agree to this. We in our work have this obligation to ensure the well-being of others. And I think we all can agree to that. And so I want to just use the time that I have to kind of talk about what those challenges are, right? Because I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to myself, right? I haven't perfected this in the least. So in order to begin this journey, we have to admit something that for some is a challenge, but let's walk through this real quick, and I think there's some questions after this so we can talk about it too. When it comes to place, we have to acknowledge that history that's purposeful in its promotion of inequity. In other words, we can't just skip over blatant attempts to dictate the who, the when, the what, and the how communities were formed and sustained if we have the intention of ensuring the benefit of all. We have to give that acknowledgement. It may make sense if I just contextualize this in examples of cities, so I'll use a city that's been in the news uh, recently that I've worked in um, since uh, people want to talk about the city of Baltimore but give no credence to the why, um, and a city that I currently serves, Charleston, South Carolina. So four years ago, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who is in the entertainment industry, um, and he called me and said, have you heard the name Freddie Gray? And I told him no. And he went on to explain that a young man had been killed in police custody um, and that the community was in an uproar. We need to do something. I was like, cool, I'm down. Whatever you want to do, I'm down. And uh, long story short, we connected with some local organizations that had their ears to the ground in Baltimore, um, specifically in the North Mount area, the Gilmore Homes where Freddie Gray was from, and uh, raised $20,000, and we're going to do distributions right in the community. And so when we got there, uh, we saw, you know, you, many times when you talk about these communities, you talk about the plight and otherwise. But what I want to emphasize is the threads of community that we saw that were common no matter what community you were in. You know, walking down the street and giving the head nod of good morning. Um, people on the stoop on, on the porch cooking chicken wings, asking us if we wanted a few. Um, even a couple young boys, maybe 10, 11 years old, all on their bikes who actually showed us where the mural was, where we were going to do the distribution. And so when we got there, you know, we interacted with the community and just serving in the best way we know how. And behind us was this amazing organization that worked with youth specifically on art. And the question that was being asked to the kids was, um, how do you define community? And so they had their chalk and they had their asphalt and they were going at it and making it happen and all these kids doing these drawings. And I looked down and I'm like, I want to see what they're doing. And I see this one little girl, she might have been eight years old. And... Um, I realized I was standing right in the middle of her picture. So I backed up, sorry, baby girl. We see what you got going on. And when I looked, um, I was frightened. I was frightened. She had drawn three figures, uh, presumably dead, with the names Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, and Freddie Gray on them. What frightened me was that when she was asked to describe community, all she could think about was death. At her age, already seeing herself as disposable, that her only life's purpose was death, and that she didn't have anything to contribute positive to community. Obviously, somebody could argue the social and multi-generational psychological reasons of why that would be the case, but I would argue that place also had a factor. And obviously, because I'm a nerd and I want to find out about these things more, I started asking myself these questions, like how many of these people are faces in our data, and how many of them are missing? What assumptions are we making in our programming, our policy, and our business strategy that causes us to miss the opportunity marker and who can be served and who can be advocated for? And when I dug into the history, this is what I found. In 1943, the Baltimore Association of Commerce proposed a freeway plan to serve anticipated traffic needs and rescue and redeem the central business district. The catch they needed to get through the quote unquote slums. According to Dr. Raymond Mole in his research entitled The Interstates and Cities, Highways, Housing, and the Freeway Revolt, in 1944, they called upon a man by the name of Robert Moses to do a report and plan and build out the urban expressways. In referencing the slums and people of color who inhabited them, he said, and I quote, the more of them that are wiped out, the healthier Baltimore will be in the long run. The city followed suit, and so from 1951 to 1971, 80 to 90% of the people that were displaced for other developments were black. 
Interestingly enough, the highway that was planned to go through the Gilmore Homes where Freddie Gray was from never got built. And so that entire community is completely separated from its basic needs. When we were down there that, that day, uh, we found out that the closest grocery store was over two miles away from the neighborhood. Flash forward to now. I have this great privilege of being able to be in this position in Charleston, South Carolina. Yes, the number one tourist city in the country, top 10 in the world. I'm obligated to say that. <laughs> and, um, but we have a lot of growth going on, um, crazy amount of growth. Our population growth is three times the national average. Our job growth rate is four times the national average. Um, we have companies like Mercedes and Boeing and Volvo and BMW all within our region. We have over 143 companies that have headquarters in Europe or the UK in Charleston County. We just brokered a deal with British Airways for direct flights from Charleston to Heathrow. Our millennial population has jumped by 60%. There's just a lot that is going on. But here's the other side of the coin that you might not know about Charleston. Charleston was the nation's capital of the slave trade. Over 40% of African slaves that reached the British colonies before the American Revolution passed through our ports, the very same ports that today every X-Series BMW leaves out of. We were the capital of disparity and there have its reverberating effects even today. The average Charlestonian spends about a third of their income on housing at another 15% for transportation. If you're below the poverty line, that could be upwards of 80%. Our housing authority residents, over 40% of them, depend on transit, yet out of 860 bus stops, less than 10% even have a shelter or a bench. Our hospitality, food, and beverage workers are the backbone of our economy, yet less than 20% of them even live downtown, and on an average of $23,000 a year, if you don't own a car, you're relegated to disconnected modes of transportation just to get to work on time. And let's not even talk about safety. Talked about us being number one for tourism. We also happen to be number one for bike pet death and injuries in the state. 45% of them are black. Number two for speed fatalities. Number five for DUIs. We have a higher pedestrian death index than New York, Chicago, LA, DC, and the city we're sitting in right now. Fact of the matter is our infrastructure hasn't matched up to our immense growth and everyday folk are being left behind. As most of us in here know, to talk about transportation is to admit, like many other places, that ownership of a motor vehicle was a ticket into economic vitality. And ownership meant that you had access, and that access afforded you certain rights and privileges. And that didn't mean that other modes weren't recognized, but slowly and surely, it's been the individual motor vehicle that has reigned supreme. Unfortunately, it's because of that fact that there's been a disparity in distribution of transportation and community building, which has translated into the elevation of one mode over every single other, based on who the user is, where they're from, where enforcement is the highest, and what assets they bring to the table, and our history shows that. When we begin to acknowledge a history that was purposeful in its promotion of inequity, we begin to see systems and practices that show equity and inequity constantly jockeying for position. All systems have structure and those structures matter. All systems create and enforce behavior and those behaviors matter. All systems produce positive and negative outcomes and those positive and negative outcomes matter. It was Seth Gooden, author and former executive, who said this, systems don't mistreat us, misrepresent us, waste our resources, govern us poorly, support an unfair status quo, and generally screw things up. People do. Daniela Meadows, in her book, Thinking in Systems of Premier, said, if you define a goal of a society as gross domestic product, that's all it will produce, gross domestic product. It will not produce welfare, equity, justice, or efficiency unless you define a goal and regularly measure and report the state of welfare, equity, justice or efficiency, and MLK did not mince words when he said to accept passively an unjust system is to cooperate with that system. So let me pull the room real quick, make sure y'all still awake. How many system changes do we have in the room? Okay, all right. How many people believe that they're playing a part in disrupting the norm? Oh, man. I would hope at some point every hand goes up when it comes to being a disruptor and a system changer, we must be persistently critical about the social norms that we've either accepted, been uninformed about, remember I'm talking to myself too, ignored, or been ignorant of that inadvertently or if we were honest, purposely perpetuate the very inequity we claim our work, our passions, our product, our services alleviate. 
In transportation and building terms, I'm essentially calling for a redefining of access. To say we want to ensure the well-being of others, remember that's our premise. We have to be comfortable with saying, I know we've done this for 30 years. I know we've been used to this process. I know change will be hard, but the current outcome is too dangerous to the people I serve to let it be as is. I must find a different way. I must identify new outcomes. I must break that silo. I must create a new decision making table. In Charleston, like any city around the country, we're not alone in this. Discrimination, racialized segregation, divestment have played major roles in creating significant housing and transportation disparities that still have its effects today. It's imperative that our vision of this work that both you and I do together does not perpetuate those inequities by treating mobility, livability, and safety as optional or inaccessible. It's important to recognize not only the opportunities to envision a new community building effort for all citizens, but also to face the challenges that presently exist. We have to be comfortable not just with the what, because we focus on that a lot, but we also have to be conscious of the who. Who benefits from the change? Who's a part of the process? And unfortunately, who gets left behind? In order to do that, we have to be comfortable with offering our transportation solutions, our community building solutions within the context of people's lived experiences, especially for those on the fringes who are often forgotten, but statistically more prone to be in need of a new vision of community. So check it out. I know part of my responsibility is to give the how, and um, I've said it multiple times already during this talk, but I'm wrestling through these things too, but I don't think that we're just supposed to talk at you. I think we're supposed to give you a little homework too. So I'm um, going to hit you with a couple of different things, um, and you might want to grab your pen, a couple of questions for you to consider during this conference um, or uh, as you go on about your work. First question, what is missing from your definition of for all? Who is not in this room from your company? your organization, or community that needs to be a part of this conversation? Have you institutionalized equity at your company or organization, or have you just hired or partnered with it? Who do you need to welcome in that you've been holding back on because of the responsibility and accountability you will have to be held to? And finally, where do you find opportunities to co-empower a community leader or advocacy partner to lead? A few years ago, Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program did the study of the nation's top 100 metropolitan cities, and they found that over two-thirds of everyday Americans are dealing with multiple inequities at the same time, right? So that's 29 million Americans that don't have access to healthy food, one million, with, for those in the urban area um, within one mile radius, in a rural area within 10 miles. One of the top five reasons parents and guardians don't even allow their kids out to walk and bike is because of crime and violence. One third of our US schools that are in pollution danger zones, one fourth of healthcare costs directly related to obesity and lack of active um, moving and active living. And 30% of people who have disabilities identifying transportation as their primary factor that's preventing them from being able to have proper healthcare. Though admittedly I'm biased and I think we all are in here, but I do believe that transportation is the common denominator for how we address the communities that we want to build and that transportation can be offered as a part of that solution within that complexity. Basically, if people don't live their lives in silos, why should our solutions be? Right. Give you a couple quotes from our two last Secretaries, Ray LaHood, he said this when he was defining livability. Livability means being able to take your kids to school, to go to work, to see a doctor, to drop by the grocery store, or the post office, go out to dinner and a movie, to play with your kids at the park, all without having to get in your car. Livability means building the communities that help Americans live the lives they want to live, whether those communities are urban centers, small towns, or rural areas. And LaHood's successor, Anthony Fox, who had the honor of serving said this in 2016, transportation serves a functional purpose as it connects people to jobs and economic opportunity, education, healthcare, and other services. But transportation's importance as a tool of social engineering has been underexamined. It has bridged distinct peoples and at times in the name of expediency or cost decimated communities. It would be a mistake to consider national transportation policy without giving adequate attention to the harmful and constructive ways a robust new transportation system could help a nation in need of both physical and social repair. 
This is probably why the Fist Fix America's uh, Surface Transportation Act or the FAST Act, our current tra federal transportation law, was extremely explicit when it talked to states and MPOs when it said, quote, we need to provide for the safe and adequate accommodation of all users, not some, in the surface transportation network, including motorized and non-motorized users in all stages of project planning, development, and operation. And look, we know that that work is hard, right? We, we do that work on a daily basis, but because we believe in the well-being of others, right, our premise, we feel like that's the work that we must do. So some of you might be asking, what does this look like in practice? And, and I don't have all the answers on that sway. So, um, but what I do wanna do is give you a sense of what we've been doing in Charleston just a little bit. And uh, I think you'll, you'll see some of these examples that are directly related to cycling and walking, but some of them that are adjacent to it, um, but are considerations that should be the case for people who are like me in my position and as advocates, what you should be calling for those people to be thinking about. So here we go, here's a couple of examples. After receiving $1.5 million in funding from new transit accommodations with our Carter system, we did not invest based on where the choice riders would be, but instead we invested where existing ridership currently is. We picked every location that was in a low income area or near workforce housing and decided to invest there first. The very first transit accommodation actually went in front of Meeting Street Manor, a 200 unit housing authority property that just so happens to have the 11th highest transit ridership in the entire system. We took it a step further and made changes in our zoning code so for those who want to develop in our city when they present their traffic studies and their transportation mitigation, they have to include all modes of transportation in that mitigation and they have to pay for it, not the city. We partnered with our Holy Spokes bike share system, which is now over the last two years boasted over almost 30,000 members and over 100,000 miles traveled, but when it launched, um, equity was missing. It was making all the mistakes that had been made in the past, but when they were called to bear, they accepted that challenge. We were able to get a better bike share partnership grant, and now residents that are 60% of the median income or lower can access the system for free. We worked with our county sales tax representatives and our state DOT engineers and received our resurfacing list early so we could push the prioritization of neglected streets in areas that are most vulnerable. When we were told no on a tactical urbanism project on Brigade Street, we have seen uh, over 20 accidents in the last three years. We decided to use our TIF money, our tax increment funding, and go back to the state DOT and say this was a priority, and hopefully in the first quarter of 2020, we'll be introducing our first protected bike infrastructure in the city's history. <clears throat> Recognizing the need for more created, creative workforce development in our department, we decided to reorganize my entire DOT prioritizing pipelining for new workers and new people who want to be engaged in the process. So we partnered with our Chamber of Commerce and our Trident Technical um, University to make sure that high school students for two years can be able to get their associate's degree and work at our department with the potential of being able to be hired on. And when we saw no diversity whatsoever in our on-call contracts, I canceled it. Yes, I canceled it rewrote the entire scope, changed the scoring criteria so we could increase the emphasis on minority women and veteran owned businesses being able to have an equal footing in the opportunities to help build the communities that we care so much about. If we're serious about changing the system, then we have to admit to ourselves that it's not just enough to sign on to a document, it's not enough to put money to a cause, it's not even enough to meet your women or people of color quota. Changing the system requires graduating from just embracing equity as a word and instead infusing it into our strategic plans, our contract negotiations, our hiring practices, and our decision-making tables. It demands that we embrace the title of catalyst and use our places of influence to unapologetically rip down the no trespassing signs that have erected over time. As we come to the end of our journey, come to our question process. Last piece. Changing the system doesn't have specific qualifications, just a willingness to be a part of the shift. I'm gonna say that again. Changing the system does not have specific qualifications, just a willingness to be a part of the shift. I know with much that I've said that whether you felt challenged or encouraged, it's easy to lift up what you don't have, what you've never experienced. 
what you don't yet understand as disqualifications for being engaged, but you know and I know that history has shown over and over and over again that it was the most unqualified people who were the ones to bring what they did not have to the table, move it to the side, and bring what they did have to make the necessary change. Let me give you a good Chucktown, that's what we call Charleston, example. If you go to the National African American Museum in DC and you go to, I think it's the third floor, um, you'll see a door to a Volkswagen van owned by a man named Esau Jenkins. In 1945, Esau Jenkins uh, lived on Johns Island, which is to the left of the peninsula. Most people, when they come to Charleston, they come downtown to the historic district and don't know that there's five other areas of the city. And so he and his wife owned the farm. And one of the things that they realized was that some of their colleagues, some of their kids, didn't have ease of access to the peninsula, to work, to school, or otherwise. And so he pulled his funds together, got a few Volkswagen vans, and started transporting folk back and forth between Johns Island and the peninsula. Here's the other piece that he did. While they were on those rides, he began teaching them the Constitution. Why, you might ask? Because in those days, in order for you to be registered to vote, you had to quote certain parts of the Constitution. And so it was in his mind, not only am I going to provide you access to your work and to your school, but I'm going to provide you access to your voice. Esau um, barely had a fourth grade education. He was not a planner. He was not an engineer. He was not an elected official. He did not have the necessary skills, didn't know the right jargon but he had a willingness to be a part of the shift. When his time on earth was through, he had helped build schools, grocery stores, health facilities, nursing home, even a credit union. There was something in his lived experience that pressed him to believe that change was more than necessary, and he stepped out of his comfort zone, used what he had, and literally created a level of legacy that allows a Keith Benjamin to even stand before you today. Let me say this last piece, and then I'll sit my behind down. I was speaking on a panel um, earlier this year, and uh, we finished the panel, and um, they said they wanted to take a picture, so I was beelining over to a wall to take the picture with the rest of the panelists. And as I beelined, um, this other black woman slipped her hand into my hand, and she squeezed really, really tight. And I don't know if you've ever been in the presence of wisdom, uh, but I know for me, and I know for those who've experienced it, you have no choice but to pay very close attention. And so when I looked in her eyes, I knew something was coming. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I needed to pay attention. And so she grabbed my hand, and then she grabbed my arm, and she looked me in the face, and she said, um, I want to apologize to you. I want to apologize to you on behalf of all of us. It's not that we don't care. It's just that we've been suppressed for so long. We've been left out for so long, seen as disposable for so long. We did not feel our voice mattered. She went on to say that she had found her voice today and was planning to go back to her community and make sure that her friends, her neighbors, found their voice as well. Look, our jobs go beyond just making sure that people can walk and bike. Our work is not just paving roads, it's not just signal timing or measuring traffic counts or regional planning or painting crosswalks. We are in the business of building community. We are in the business of writing new narratives on what access and opportunity look like. We have people and need people who have their hearts and their minds focused on acknowledging the mistakes of our history, finding solutions at the intersections, graduating from equity just being sprinkles to it being a priority in every social structure we build and never allowing what we don't have to prevent us from embracing what we, can't, what we can do. There's a bunch of people, citizens, visitors, stakeholders, advocates in rural and suburban areas that are depending on both of us. That when they get in their motor vehicle, when they're standing at a transit stop, when they hop on their bike, and when they put on their walking shoes, that we have their well-being in mind. I leave you with this quote from Esau Jenkins. He said this, I asked myself this question, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer that I got was, yes, you are. I'm no better than 
the next. I'm no worse off than the next, so I do everything I can for people in order to help myself. Thank you all. So I only have um, about 10 minutes uh, for the Q&A section here, but um, uh, this is my opportunity to do my own little um, uh, daily show. So just think of me like uh, Trevor Noah with less hair. <laughs> um, Keith, um, you know, transportation is one of the most ubiquitous sectors, which means that your work has to contend with and has an influence on a whole suite of challenges in the pu broader public sector, health, public safety, economics, housing, and environmental impact. As one of the youngest transportation directors in the country, how do you embrace that challenge as you're um, leading a transportation uh, department there in Charleston? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's eye-opening. Um, I think the easiest way, because we got 10 minutes, I'll, I'll answer it in this way. I realized very quickly the valley between the national discourse, what we're doing here, and what actually gets down to the local municipality. Right? I came into a department where my predecessor was in office for three decades, and I had staff who had, <clears throat> in all their years being with the city, 16 years, 23 years, 34 years, had never come into a space like this. Right? You know, mid-sized cities, you might not get a travel expense to come to a conference in, in Portland. Um, and that's no shade to the conference itself, it's just an understanding that at the local level, the discourse we might have on the next couple of days, realizing that for a lot of our local municipalities, it may not ever reach them. But it's still on those local municipalities to review projects, to review developments, to make stipulations about traffic mitigations, right? And so it's been really interesting to try to figure out what that connection looks like and how to make that connection better. I think one of the assets that, that saves me a little bit versus some of my other colleagues is coming from the national level locally. And so I can call in favors and say, look, look, you know, you know let, my, let my staffer come to such and such conference or X and Y and Z training or whatever that is. But that's a major gap that I think we have to figure out how we close because there's, there's an enormous responsibility on our local municipality staff to dictate what community looks like in the future. And if they're not equipped with the necessary tools, the stuff that we're gonna be talking about over the next couple of days, you can't expect the shift to happen um, in an expedient fashion. And that's just facts, right? And um, so I'm, I'm really, don't have an answer on that, but I'm really intrigued about how that gap closes because that was something that was really eye-opening to me. I'm, I'll say this one piece, right, for example, um, um, there was a conference that I sent one of our planning staff to, her first time going to a national conference of that scale. The first thing she texted me back was, I didn't know there was this many women leaders. So that, that has nothing to do with transportation, but just the visual of I can occupy this space too was something that clicked in her mind from attending that conference. And so I'm really interested in how that connection gets better. Thank you. Um, Looking at some of the themes coming in, thank you all who have had an opportunity to submit some questions. If you haven't gotten one in yet, um, I think we'll have time for one more after this one, so uh, don't hesitate to get those in. You talked earlier about being in the business of building community. I really love that. Um, and you referred earlier to the vision of transportation that both Secretary LaHood um, and uh, Secretary Fox had for transportation, that it serves a functional purpose and that the definition of livability is to have all of your mobility needs met without having to drive in a car, right? But we also have to contend with the differing opinions that people have and some of the stigma that comes with and the challenges associated with um, transportation investments. Um, a lot of the questions that I'm getting um, from folks are, so we think we have all of these great solutions that are gonna help to improve safety and create mobility options, but um, people in community see it either, either as a threat or a change in their community, or um, they don't feel like it's something that's being built for them. How um, would you encourage us to try to embrace that conversation and um, embrace those challenges? Um. We have to be okay with dealing with the complexities that we claim we is not in our expertise area. Right. Right. You drop in a community, we want better walking here, we want better biking here. Well, somebody just got shot on Hanover Street five times, 
So we have a safety issue. What are you going to do about that? Right. And so how do you take the work that you're passionate about and contextualize it within what that community is dealing with, right? Um, and what they're trying to figure out, right? Um, one of the interesting things that we have, um, you have the peninsula, you have West Ashley, Johns and James Island, and then Daniel Island. West Ashley is very suburban in context, has the vast majority of our population. Over 84% of those citizens leave their home every day, leave West Ashley in their individual car to go to work, drop their kid off at school every single day. Yet when we did this major planning process for what West Ashley will look like for the future, over 60% of them said that they would choose another mode of transportation if it was connected, if it was affordable, if it was reliable, if it was safe, right? So the opportunity for change is there. How do we contextualize it, right? It's not necessarily just to come to Jesus moment. It's, it's, it's more of how does this make sense for me in my daily work, right? Um, and the needs that I have. And, and why, how and why would that make sense? And, and I, I don't think we do enough contextualization. We jump right to what we're immediately passionate about um, and why it makes sense for us and not necessarily why it makes sense for those other individuals and what context does that need to be in. For some folk, it might be a matter of connection of modes of travel, right? I might drive to this particular location, but then I might get on bike share to get the, the last mile, right? Um, um, I might take uh, um, a transit and express in, but as I make my daily moves um, throughout the urban core that I'm in, I usually walk to them or otherwise, and so that's what matters to me, right? I think our context has to be more broad and more accepting of the different nuances of how walking and biking can be infused into people's daily lives. That's great. We got time for one more, yes? Wonderful. Um, a question here that gets into uh, measurement. Um, any best practices or resources you've seen um, to measure racial equity outcomes that go beyond infrastructure investments? How have you gotten management support to adopt and incorporate such measurements? You know, I guess because you're the transportation director, you just tell them what to do, right? Facts. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> but could you talk about kind of the most impactful or relevant measures when it comes to um, things beyond lane miles or the uh, number of um, uh, this, that, or the other transportation uh, measures? How, how are you embracing that um, and or pursuing those measures? So I think I, I'll, I'll give three pieces to that. One is um, figuring out how to navigate within the existing system. Um, one of the things that does trouble me is sometimes a lot of our examples around biking and walking are in places that don't have the circumstances that somebody in the South has, right? I'm in a state that's fourth in the country in the amount of roads that are owned by the state DOT. I'm also in a state where legislation says that a local municipality can't do its own tax, so I'm dependent on the county for our sales tax funds that go towards infrastructure. Yet because we're Charleston, the everyday citizen doesn't know about the complexities of the decision-making process, so this death that just happened on Friday um, that I got to report on on Saturday, I already have emails from state legislators, local uh, uh, citizens and otherwise telling me, what are you gonna do about it? Right, so that complexity of decision making sometimes isn't that credence to that um, for, for a state, a city like mine isn't given. And so I have to work in the system and so working with the state DOT is there. But I think I've also tried to challenge us at the local level to take advantage of the nuances of policy that let us make certain stipulations. Um, the process that I mentioned in my, my talk about the transit accommodations ordinance is, was an injection into an existing process we have, but just changing the stipulations of it. So every major development in our city, um, a commercial that's 10,000 square feet or more, a restaurant that's 4,000 square feet or more, a gas station that has six units or more, um, a development um, that has 45 units or more, all have to go through this technical review process and there's certain stipulations with it. And if you go through that process, you have to do a traffic study. There's no, there was nothing at the time outside of sidewalks that was stipulated in the city zoning code that a uh, applicant would have to bring to the table in their transportation mitigation about multimodalism and about how they would mitigate it. Outside of check with the DOT and see if you got to widen the lane or put in a turn lane or something like that. We decided let's take use of our zoning code and make the stipulation in there so when you're coming to present, you already know that based on the IT standards of um, your, your, your trips, um, based on the level of service, we took advantage of that. If it's a level of service of C or below, you have to provide transit accommodations at your expense. 
and that's in our code. And so now developers already know when they come to the table with their strategy of how they're gonna move people, they know that they have to come not just with how we're gonna hold all these cars, but how are people gonna walk, how are people gonna bike, how are people gonna easily access transit. So it's just, I think we've, we've capitalized on taking advantage of existing systems to stipulate what should be the case anyway. Great. Um, Melanie, one more? Or are we, okay. I really wanted to get a chance to ask this question because um, just hearing a little bit about your background and your resume, it's amazing uh, the kind of strides you've been able to make and the type of leadership you've been able to exercise. And when we were preparing earlier, can you talk a little bit about the kind of a message, if you could, for folks who are further along in their careers who have an opportunity to potentially open doors um, for people who are coming up? And can you also talk about or give some advice for folks um, who are maybe getting started in their career who are looking for a door uh, to walk through? Yeah, um, I'm blessed to be in this position because there's people who went out of their way to pause their purpose for a moment to help me achieve mine. Um, there was somebody, um, a black mentor, who was in a powerful room and when asked, um, we need new blood, we need an opportunity to change the dynamics of how our city is functioning, he decided to say my name. Um, and I'm eternally grateful for that and what that's allowed me to do um, and uh, exposed me to. But it also um, was a reminder to me that um, how slim the chances are for me to even be in the space. If he wasn't in the room, if the question wasn't there, um, what type of access, what type of pipeline is there for me to be able to take up a leadership role, to be able to articulate the message that I gave earlier in a space that, that might cause somebody to think about something different when they go back to their community and how they interact. And so I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in that regard. I would just encourage somebody who, who is looking not at their experiences that actually qualify them, but only looking at what they feel like disqualifies them to change their thought process and to remove that ceiling, right? And to know that you can, you can be in this space. You can be the head of transportation, you can lead an MPO, you can lead a public works department, um, you can be an elected official. Um, you have the right to occupy that space Right? And don't, don't allow anybody to pigeonhole you into the space of like, I can only maximize myself just as an advocate. Great. I can only maximize myself if I start this nonprofit and I'll, I'll just work from the outside. Yes, we need people there, but we need you here too. And you have, you have all the right in the world to be in this space just as anybody else. That's great. Well, Keith, I want to thank you again. Appreciate it, boss.